I have to say that, uh, you know, my 12-year-old my son is a big football fanatic, soccer fanatic. And so when I told him I was coming to the Qatar Foundation, he was really, he thought that was like the coolest thing in the world because of the Barcelona jerseys. So um, here we are. Another dimension. Um, but you have to work on the branding because he had no idea that this was an educational institution. Qatar, yeah. Oh, it was Qatar Airways. Yeah, right. But they used to do the foundation, didn't they? Yeah. Um, Anyway, okay, and so thanks to the QF uh, for convening this. Um, and the second point, if you're getting AIA credit for this, I'll explain the title of, of this talk. The title of this talk was explained in the last panel when my colleague from Carnegie Mellon pointed out that it, or, or claimed that education uh, was a customer service. That's when you're after education. That's when it's over. So, so if, if you want to see some of, in a sense, the, the debates that, that ought to happen in uh, a university, then maybe that's where we could begin. This is not about customer service. Um, nevertheless, uh, there are many questions, uh, indeed, posed by the title of this conference. I'll leave that. Um, and I'm going to try to address them historically. Um, learning from Education City, maybe historically. Uh, among these questions, I want to focus on the most obvious one, the question of learning or education, like I said. So what is it to learn? Uh, <clears throat> although I haven't yet seen most of the city myself, this is clearly, there's clearly quite a lot of architecture in Education City. So, so we can begin you know, with the question of architecture and, and learning, uh, a question that I, I think is actually best posed, I must say, uh, by the design, the beautiful design that, uh, for the Qatar National Library that Rem Kulas showed just, just now. Um, or earlier, earlier today. Uh, so it's really through that filter that I want to pose this question. So despite the fact that the rest of the buildings in Education City, as we've been hearing, are actual university buildings, uh, and although I haven't yet seen any of them basically except this one, uh, or except driving by, um, uh, it, it is my impression that the library poses the question that I want to pose in a most interesting way. Uh, not least because Kuhas uh, is surely among the most enlightened and self-reflective architects working today. Um, so even though he had to, had to, had to run, uh, these, the questions that I am posing are posed to, uh, to Rem. Um, so it's in this spirit and guided by the architectural particulars of that design, that's over there, right? Um, that with this brief presentation, uh, I want to pose another related question uh, to the one the bigger question of architecture and uh, education that is essentially a philosophical question. And I, I actually am posing this question to Rem Kulhas, and we'll, it, he'll, it'll get to him, uh, but I'm also posing it to you. Um, it's going to take a little while to get to the question. Uh, so to do that, I have to begin historically, and, uh, and I'm afraid philosophically, and I'll also have to begin in Europe. Um, uh, but, uh, but I'm not really talking about west to east or east to west transfers, uh, identity-based uh, concerns. Rather, uh, I'm talking about the question of how truth is produced, how universal truth claims, we can say, claims to knowledge as such, uh, are produced under different historical, national, and cultural circumstances. Education, in other words. So in, in, here's an example. In 1784, a group of German, basically Prussian philosophers, responded publicly to the question, what is enlightenment? Uh, now, that question was posed in Berlin, uh, and which was soon to become the site of one of the world's great universities, and the model for the American universities, by and large, that are here, or an, an important model. Uh, among those who responded to that question, what is enlightenment, was the philosopher Immanuel Kant, uh, in a short but seminal text under that title. So here's the philosophical interlude. Despite its origins, its philosophical origins, however, this question is already an architectural one, so we're going to get to that part of it. Uh, but I'll, I'll explain now that since the 18th century, libraries, libraries have been associated with the European Enlightenment project, um, despite their actual origins, as you know very well, lying much further east, much closer to where we are today with, for example, the Great Library of Alexandria and, and others. Nevertheless, the European Enlightenment project basically borrowed the category of the library as, an, as a figure for enlightenment. Um, and indeed, for the past century and a half, libraries have also been associated with nation building. Um, 
And uh, from, for example, the French Bibliothèque Nationale, uh, completed in 1868, to the American Library of Congress, uh, completed in 1897, uh, and there are many, many others. So too have universities. So all these institutions kind of gathered together. All, universities too have, uh, have been used uh, as uh, objects of nation building, from the University of Berlin to Nanjing University in China. In that sense, the Qatar National Library's double function, that's what's very interesting about it, I think, double function as a resource and symbol for the state of Qatar, but also as a, uh, as a resource and a symbol for Education City, fits right into this lineage. In other words, these two things are coming together. It's also an important symbol of Qatar's uh, national project, as I gather, uh, of, of transitioning from a carbon-based economy to a knowledge-based economy, as all the websites say. So in this respect, and regardless of its European origins, um, in many traditions around the world, the answer to the question, what is enlightenment, uh, could simply be, uh, enlightenment is knowledge. It could be very straightforward, knowledge, plain and simple. But in 1784, with the French Revolution and the founding of democratic nation states just over the horizon, that's not exactly how Immanuel Kant answered the question. He didn't just say knowledge. Instead, Kant defined enlightenment as, quote, this is a slightly complicated formulation, but it makes sense if you think about it. Quote, mankind's exit from its self-incurred immaturity. Self-incurred immaturity. So, so basically what it means is that for Kant, enlightenment was something like growing up, was coming, a kind of coming of age, or in a word, education. It's a process, right? It's a process. Which in Germany, as elsewhere, was eventually translated into a national public education system dedicated ideally to what in German is known as Bildung, uh, or the personal growth of informed citizens. Uh, and this was also, the, the US uh, had its own version of this, and again, the institutions, your neighbors, uh, are in, in many ways the outcome of that. Thus, in 1932, this is a, again quick philosophical summary, summary, somewhat ironically, by the way, 1932, the year before Hitler's rise to power, uh, the neo-Kantian German philosopher Ernst Cassirer was able to define it, by that time they actually defined what they called the mind of the Enlightenment, as an acute, acute combination of analytical and synthetic thinking in a worldview that originated in the European 17th century with Descartes and Newton. And so here's an architectural monument to that worldview. Um, the French architect, Etienne Louis, Louis Boulet's unbuilt cenotaph for Newton, for Isaac Newton, uh, designed the same year, 1784, in fact, that Kant published his answer to the question, what is enlightenment? And here's another one here, now we converge. Uh, another unbuilt project by Boulet for the Bibliothèque du Roi, uh, the, or Royal Library, in Paris in 1786, a couple years later, uh, which I am essentially arguing to you here, bears a direct relevance to the Qatar National Library. Whether it was intentional or not, doesn't matter. Now, according to Kassir, by, by the end of the 18th century, a system of thought that combined observation with ideation or empiricism with rationalism in an all-encompassing philosophy of enlightenment based on universal human reason, this is a, basically an ideology, but, but this is how it was defined, um, had come to govern not only mathematics and the natural sciences, but also psychology, religion, law, political theory, and even aesthetics. Another name for this knowledge is universal knowledge, or indeed imperial knowledge, because of course this was written from, from Europe, this text, as it were, this, this definition, uh, and from imperial Europe. Nevertheless, there is an important split in, in the original Kantian definition, the original philosophical definition, between what Kant calls the private and public use of reason. Now, by private, Kant does not mean anything like domestic or like in the house, in the sense of restricting to the domain of, of re restricting reason, the domain of reason to the interior, like in the private household or private library even, or the interior life of the human soul. By placing restrictions on the private use of reason, Kant meant instead to limit the use of reason, or, or in other words, independent critical thought, um, when it comes to one's productive social or economic fun function, in one's job, we could say, um, or as a sub subject of political authority, which in Kant's time meant as a subject of Frederick the Great's Prussia. So in other words, you don't talk back to Frederick the Great publicly. Th that's what private, private use of reason meant. 
Um, there, according to Kant, the enlightened, reasonable, and above all critical subject is nevertheless constrained to, quote, obey, to play by the rules in order not to disrupt the orderly functioning of society, because, of course, Kant was no revolutionary. Um, and there, especially, the maxim that was promulgated by the enlightened monarch, as he was known, Frederick, uh, was to be strictly adhered to, argue but obey. Now, in contrast, in, in, in what Kant calls the public arena, the other side of this, um, reasonable argumentation and critical reflection could be granted unrestricted freedom. This is the university, basically. Um, or what is sometimes called autonomy. Again here, what Kant means by the public use of reason may be some, somewhat counterintuitive to us uh, today. He doesn't so much mean outside, in, in a city square, or in front of a public building. Uh, uh, there, th that's where you were supposed to obey. Um, no, what Kant means by public is what would much later be called the public sphere, the realm of civic discourse, the entire communicative arena, the newspapers, the media, and above all, the sphere of books and education, the open book, right, that rem symbol. In Kant's early formulation, this sphere is formed around what he calls a reading public. And in that sense, it privileges written discourse, especially the discourse of a citizenry, a literate citizenry, with free access to books, where ideas are freely exchanged and constructive critique of, of the established order might freely occur. Now, for Kant, the guardian of this public space or sphere, again, somewhat counterintuitively, is the scholar. By scholar, Kant does not, however, mean the narrow sense of a monk-like figure who finds refuge from politics in the monastic library. Instead, he means figures very much like himself and his colleagues, thinking out loud about the question, what is enlightenment? Um, <clears throat> these figures were philosophers, theologians, scientists, poets, editors, publishers, and others dedicated to the free and critical exchange of ideas. Now, you move the scene from Berlin to Paris and look again at Boulet's drawing here, uh, which we must remember does not depict a revolutionary or even a democratic architecture. This is a royal library designed for the French King Louis XVI. Uh, we might imagine these quote unquote enlightened figures to be those very figures. They're all men, of course, um, shown in the lower levels of library, reading, browsing, or reaching for the books. Yeah. Um, now, although this project has a long and complex influence on the architecture of libraries, Boulay's other project, the Dome Cenotaph for Newton, has a more direct relationship with certain university libraries uh, that I'm going to quickly show, especially in the U.S., which, of course, is home to mu much, most of the universities whose buildings populate Doha's education city. But before I quickly translate this difficult question, what is enlightenment, into the American context, we must clarify two more little historical points. First. The motto with which Kant begins his definition is dare to know. Now, in this respect, Boulet's library already begins with something like a knowledge economy, dare to know. But how does this command reconcile with the other command, to argue but obey? How do you dare to know and argue but obey at the same time? What is the relationship between knowing and obeying? The contradiction is seemingly resolved with the division between the private and public use of reason. In a sense, we can say that Kant's definition, you know, in other words, you do, you do these in different places, basically. In the university, you can dare to know. Out in the world, uh, you, uh, you, you, you are, in a, in a sense, uh, o obedient. Now, this, this whole um, drama was played out in something that was called the, the conflict of the faculties. Uh, because while Kant was able to address his critical philosophy with relative freedom to Prussia's enlightened monarch, Frederick the Great, he was less successful with his successor, William II, who censored his writings. Um, and so in 1798, Kant responded to that with a short text called The Conflict of the Faculties, and this is basically seen as a foundational text for the European and American university system. Uh, and I'll, I'll summarize the, the, the idea of the conflict, and I'll, then I'll explain uh, the relationship to, uh, believe it or not, Kuhlhaas's library. Um, the basic idea is that upon its founding, the university, uh, and this is the University of Berlin, uh, has four faculties, law, medicine, medicine, theology, and philosophy. And Kant called the first three, law, medicine, and theology, which trained the clergy, uh, the higher faculties. We would call them today the professional schools, like the journalism school or the engineering school and whatever. Um, and then philosophy, all that I've been doing right now with you, that's the lower faculty. That's, that's, you know, there's applied knowledge, there's reflective knowledge, there's those kinds of structures, right? 
And the first one, applied knowledge, is higher than, in, than the second in Kant's scheme, simply because it's the most useful to the state. It belongs to the private sphere, to this, the place in which you do your job. Um, but his basic claim was that the political and economic interests that therefore associated with that kind of knowledge were taught in the higher faculties uh, was in inherent conflict with the free critical knowledge taught in the lower uh, philosophical faculties, which was destined to remain subordinate, um, hence the conflict of the faculties. Now, um, clearly this little excerpt from the canon of European philosophy has very little to do with Education City or Rem Koolhaas's design. Um, for the library, except that I did notice that the American universities in Education City are all mainly represented by their higher or professional faculties. Um, medicine, engineering, business, computer science, diplomacy, journalism, the design arts, and so on. Perhaps, as in Kant's day, this affirms uh, the priority of those faculties in the current world order. Those are, in a sense, higher. A possible exception about which we heard in a very interesting conversation earlier uh, is the, is the uh, Qatar Faculty of Islamic Studies, uh, or HBKU more generally. Anyway, from its founding in 1825, America's most, America's most architecturally significant campus, uh, the University of Virginia, designed by former President uh, Thomas Jefferson, was plagued by a version of this conflict of the faculties, as was Jefferson himself. Um, who was a sort of philosopher king. In the pavilion surrounding the famous lawn, uh, of which you have a kind of variation in your strip, I think, which Jefferson intended as a lesson in architectural classicism, the teaching of law and medicine competed with the teaching of literature and philosophy. The philosophy. These mixed in this, in this design. But the university's central domed library, so shown here with enlightenment's light shining down upon it, appeared to resolve the, the conflict at least by housing the books which, in which the conflict might take, take, be taken up in a critical manner. In other words, the books were what kind of held everything together. Jefferson's University, and especially the Central Library Rotunda, is therefore often said to be a monument to American democracy. Despite the fact, uh, I must point out, that the campus itself was built by slaves. More accurately, it, it can be called, therefore, a monument to the contradictions of American de democracy. Among its main functions was to train citizens for the new republic, all of whom were male and most of whom were from the ruling classes. In that sense, Jefferson's library rotunda was a kind of symbolic national library um, and a precursor, to, in fact, to the domed library of Congress that was actually built in Washington about 75 years later. <clears throat> As it happened right around the same time, Jefferson's library burned uh, along with the books because after all, the light of enlightenment, uh, i.e. knowledge, can be dangerous. Uh, in this case, it was electric light fueled by, the coal that started the, fueled by coal that started the fire in a, in a stark reminder that knowledge is often carbon-based. In any case, uh, Jefferson's library was quickly rebuilt um, by the same architects, McKim, Mead, and White, who at the very same time were designing the campus of my university, Columbia, Columbia University, including, this is so Columbia at more or less the state that Education City is now, you know, under construction, just basically just finished, uh, and including Columbia's central domed library, which you see here in 1897. So finally, if Jefferson's campus and its domed library are a monument to the contradictions, we can call them the conflicts of early American democracy, we can call Columbia's campus and its domed library a monument to the contradictions of early American imperialism. As still is true today, that imperialism was often as economic as it, it was as often economic as it was political. The Columbia Dome, for example, was built with money from the China trade. But it was, this was also the period in the 1890s uh, of the official closing of the American frontier, which completed the century-long conquest of native peoples and the beginning of America's colonial adventures in the Caribbean, in the Philippines, and in Latin America. That was what nation building, in a, in a sense, became. And uh, it was the period that saw the rise of finance capitalism and the hegemony of Wall Street, just downtown from Columbia, uh, at the epicenter of what uh, Kulhas so memorably called delirious New York. And finally, with the Cold War expansion of what was called national science, research universities like Columbia, which had participated in the Manhattan Project, were instrumental in maintaining the so-called Pax Americana as key components of the military-industrial complex. But they were also important sites of enlightened public discourse, of critique, in Kant's sense. At Columbia, for example, right there, right there in that dome, Edward Said, about whom we just heard, uh, benefiting from the autonomy granted to the scholar, 
articulated a profound critique of Orientalism and Western imperialism, um, the very same Orientalism on which Euro-American imperialism had rested since the 19th century and defended the existence uh, of uh, the state of Palestine in that dome. But as with Rome, whose domed pantheon was a distant source for all these others, the sun eventually sets on every empire, even one that combines a carbon-based economy with a knowledge-based one as efficiently as did the United States. Architecturally today, the American University, with Columbia, my own uh, uh, university, is a brilliant example, stands, broadly speaking, as a solemn, reflective monument to imperial decline. Something similar can be said about many of the great universities, uh, European universities, and especially about the decline of the European welfare state uh, to which so many of these universities belonged. Okay, now, finally back to Doha and to the Qatar National Library. Um, I understand that this new library aims to correct some of the distortions of European imperial knowledge by making available a wealth of materials devoted to the Gulf region, and I think especially in that, that sunken library in the middle. Uh, but maybe it's also aimed at something higher. For I cannot help but see those same figures from Boulet's drawing of a French royal library, philosophers, theologians, scientists, poets, editors, publishers, and others haunting this drawing uh, by OMA of the Qatar National Library. Or are they businessmen and computer scientists? So which is it, higher faculty or lower faculty or both? Whether or not he or his colleagues intended to cite this earlier French precedent, my hunch is that the building, the, the, the Qatar building, uh, harbors such a pa that, that it harbors this past is confirmed, in fact, by the video that accompanied the library's announcement. It's a great video, you should watch it, in which uh, Kulhas explains the brilliant concept with an elegantly folded piece of paper. So on this, I'm going to let him speak for himself, even though he's not here, um, describing the builder, build, you've heard this, you just heard him say this, uh, arena -like con th th this configuration of arenas, um, he says, quote, a person who enters finds himself in the center of the library, just like in the Boulay, um, and from that center can actually see in one glance an amphitheater of books that immediately explains to you everything you could possibly read or want to read. So an amphitheater of books, so this is... Um, so where Boulay's project uh, surrounds French royal subjects with an implied universe of books arranged on the walls of a vault, a big long vault, OMA surrounds Qataris and their American colleagues from Education City with an implied universe of books on a folded plane tilted gently upward toward the horizon. So my question to Rem, from one citizen of a declining empire to another, uh, is simply this, is this enlightenment? Thanks. <laughs>